to outline. Pull out. We would deal with 1 Peter chapter 3. We looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 uh, last Sunday morning with reference to the matter of the mixed marriage situation and uh, <coughs> the companion passage to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is 1 Peter chapter 3. And I believe if we can get these two chapters well in hand with reference to much of the problems of today, we will have a standard whereby we can certainly have the mind of the Lord and be guided according to our counsel, guided according to our life, and that which may be uh, encumbered upon us in light of our circumstances. First Peter chapter 3, and I'd like to read the first seven verses because it's in the first seven verses that you deal with this particular subject, which is a companion to that subject in 1 Corinthians 7, in light of a mixed marriage uh, situation. Let me emphasize once again that this is a situation that arises after a couple have been married. They have been married and someone gets saved. And then there is the question, well, what do I do now? Since I'm saved and my partner is not saved, before the Lord, what are our circumstances? What, are our, what is to be our manner of life? And uh, sometimes this can be rather difficult and problematic. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we discovered that the word of the Lord informed us that as long as the unbeliever was pleased to dwell with the believer, there was not to be the leaving or the putting apart. And the reason for it is twofold. We discovered that because of the believer, the unbeliever is sanctified or set apart as a recognized bona fide union before God for the uh, purpose of the procreation of the family. And then the second reason was that, uh, what know ye not? That you might have the privilege of leading that partner to Christ. Now that's a twofold reason given in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that in a mixed marriage relationship there is not to be any parting as long as the unbeliever is pleased to dwell with the believer. And uh, let me emphasize once again that the conduct of the believer is not to be changed to the conduct of the unbeliever. Now, <clears throat> let's continue on uh, in that vein of thought in light of 1 Peter chapter 3 and see what the Lord instructs us in these few verses. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, <coughs> they also may apart from the word be one by the conduct of the wives, while they behold your chaste conduct coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plait plaiting the hair, and of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in old time the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye wives, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. All right, let's bow together in prayer, shall we? <clears throat> now before your throne, dear Father, we're thankful that we have a heavenly Father into whose presence we can come because of the rent veil of the body of the Lord Jesus on the cross 
And because of his shed blood, we have the privilege of the access boldly into your presence. And grant, gracious Father, that in the hour which is before us, we might have the enlightening ministry of God the Holy Spirit, we might be taught of him, and that we might have our lives enlarged because of thus saith the Lord. Encourage the hearts of our dear people. Love them and establish them. Give them a pathway that is a pathway of blessing and joy to their own hearts and to their own lives with great honor and glory to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, what precipitated our bit of study was a, an emphasis that I gave a few Sundays ago, which uh, lent itself to be a misunderstanding. Well, if you have one member of that union uh, which is not saved, the other is saved, then does that other member of that union just simply take over? and uh, live uh, in uh, the way that is uh, uh, completely uh, dominating the scene of the home. And we have the answer given quite specifically in this particular section of the Word of the Lord. Now, in the first part of verse 1, let's entitle this the command. And it is a participle which is used as a command and it's this, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, apart from the word, be won by the conduct of the wives. Now, you will see that there is not to be a change by way of responsibility and function in the home. The husband is still to assume his rightful responsibilities, and the wife is to assume her rightful responsibilities in that home, even though it may be a divided home by virtue of one member being saved and the other, other member not being saved. There is not the idea that the woman is to assume the responsibility of the man or the man to assume possibly the responsibility of the woman, whatever that might be. For it is in the first part of this verse, you see, that relationships of man and woman maintain themselves even though it may be a mixed marriage situation for the time being. Now then, he gives us uh, a manner of conduct. And at this particular point, he's speaking with reference to the ladies and the man not being a saved individual, you see. And so he elaborates upon it. And notice down through verse 5, you have the explanation of the conduct for the saved woman in light of this situation. First of all, if there is such a thing, and it does exist within the framework of the home, that you will observe in verse 1 that if any obey not the word, or if the husband is not saved, they also may apart from the word be won by the conduct of the wives. Now this is a rather a strange verse in some ways because we read in <coughs> the book of Romans that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now at this juncture someone is going to say, well do we not have a conflict then or a uh, contradiction of the scriptures with reference to how one may be saved. No, we really don't, because there is more than one way to preach the Word. <laughs> and that's what he's driving at here. It is not the audible declaration, don't you see, but the manifestation of that which is true for the saved partner. 
that the individual, and it, as I say, that the passage dealing with the woman, that the man might be one by virtue of that message of the conduct of the wife. Now, he's dealing with conduct. You see, your English word conversation there has uh, undertaken quite a transition by virtue of meaning. And the word simply means conduct or behavior. Now then, you'll see the manner of the message of the saved wife before the unsaved husband. While they... Behold, or watch your chaste conduct with fear. Now, I've done a little work with reference to this matter of the word fear. And it appears, ladies, twice in this passage. One in a rather emphatic manner. Now, I well, now, it can't be that the woman is supposed to be scared to death all the time. <laughs> That, uh, that uh, now you might have reason to be, but um, uh, that surely can't be the meaning here. And I don't believe it is. I believe it's the idea that they behold your manner of conduct with fear in the sense, and this fear looks at someone being brought into terror by virtue of intimidation. You understand? Here is fear that becomes the possession of one because of the intimidation or the threat of another. Now, that's the wrong way. Absolutely the wrong way. There isn't any place in Scripture and I'll say this, and there isn't any place in the society with our law that allows it either. Here, last year, um, we had a situation just before, this, just before the Sunday service, as some of you will recall. And uh, uh, there was a lot of screaming out here and whatnot. And um, uh, in came a woman that uh, had uh, been pretty well beat up. And um, oh, I had not uh, been associated with anything like that up here, but um, Mary Joseph happened by just about that time and was a tremendous help to me because uh, uh, I didn't realize it, but this, this lady was an Indian lady. And, uh, and she had an Indian husband that uh, had uh, used her as a punching bag. And uh, she finally got off in the bush out there, and he was so stewed he couldn't find her. And she sat there in our kitchen, and uh, uh, so we got a hold of the police. And uh, uh, I was asking Murray, well, just what do you do in something like this? And he said, well, we just better let the uh, police handle this at this moment. And uh, I stood there in the kitchen while two policemen talked to this woman. And... Uh, <coughs> The policeman said, now, listen, we can't tell you what to do, but we can simply inform you of your rights as a woman, that if you will come down to the office, the station, and uh, I don't know what all they had to do, but there can be an order issued that uh, he can't touch you. He can't touch you. Well, she wouldn't do that. And um, they tried to talk her into it. Well, that woman was just scared to death. Well, she had good reason to be. She had a knot on her head, and she had some skin places, and she had, man, she was beat up. Now, the Bible, absolutely, the Bible, absolutely, gives no, shall we say, condolence for such conduct. I don't care who it is. However, 
for the saved wife. It is, I believe, fear from the standpoint that there is the potential. There is the potential of the physical harm. And so there's conduct, conduct, which is pure conduct, chaste conduct even in that adverse circumstance. Now, it's just pretty hard. It's just pretty hard for uh, action, bodily action to be taken against conduct that's pure. Conduct that's chaste. Now then, he emphasizes in verse 3 and 4, who's adorning, who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating of hair, of wearing of gold, or putting on apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Now, ladies, He's not saying you can't wear these things. And after all, it says of putting on apparel, I bet you better put on apparel. And uh, uh, he's not saying that you're not to do these things, but he's given the contrast, don't you see, that it is not to be the outward that's tried to, that you try to please your husband by. Or it's not to be the outward which bears the message. Now that's a wrong concept. And it's, uh, it's too often followed that um, uh, if uh, uh, I appear in such a way, well, then uh, I'm going to win my husband. Don't you believe it? Don't you believe it? Uh, more than one servant of the Lord has counseled either partner that by virtue of conduct, that they ought to participate in godless conduct in order to win their partner. Don't you believe it? That's not the Bible. It's pure conduct. It's chaste conduct. It's right conduct. And right here it says in verse 4, But let it be the hidden man of the heart. Let it be that chaste, precious spiritual life in which, uh, the, in, in that which is not corruptible. Do you see that? There isn't to be anything by virtue of the conduct of the life which smacks towards corruptibility. And he goes on to elaborate of a meek and quiet spirit. Now, the meek means um, that which is genteel, and the quiet, the tranquility. Here the other day, there was a man uh, came in, and I told him he could take all that fertilizer he wanted because <laughs> I'd like for him to take it all out of there, save us the work of shoveling. <laughs> and uh, so he'd been working on it. And um, one of the boys uh, was out helping him because that's pretty hard work, and he's a, he's a retired man. And uh, he made this remark. I guess he just happened to find us in the right moment. He said, everyone seems to be happy around here. <laughs> I guess the old cow hadn't kicked anyone yet. But uh, <laughs> he said, uh, man alive, uh, uh, people around here seem to be happy. Happy. Well, I trust that that'll be the testimony. Well, it's tranquility that arises out of a heart that's settled before the Lord. And... Uh, I just love this. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the meek, the gentle. I was I was looking in one of my Greek lex lexicons, and do you know another thought behind it? Now hang on to your hat. <laughs> Soothing. <laughs> Soothing. <laughs> do you ever feel like pinching his head off? <laughs> well. Bite the tongue, ladies, <laughs> and start doing the smoothing, <laughs> the soothing, eh? 
Well, that, that's the thought behind it. The incorruptible heart. Now, I'll tell you, these are tremendous standards, aren't they? Now, would you notice, would you notice, suppose you're all alone, all alone. Well, no one cares, and I can't do it. Would you notice something here in the last part of verse 4? which is in the sight of God. What's it say? Great price. Indescribable value. Uh, unfathomable wealth. This term right here of great price, that term in the Greek, comes from two words. One is palus and the other is telos. Palus is much and telos is end. And you put them together and it shows that it's the value which is of the uttermost. It, it, it has come to its total completion. And you just simply can't find in the scriptures a term which expresses value much greater than that. It just thrills me because there is so much in some circles made of the idea of the servitude of women that I can hardly stand it. And I've always said the man may be the head, but the woman's got to be the heart. And if you've got heart trouble, I don't care how good the head is. It isn't going to be worth a hoot. And uh, look at the heart. You dear ladies, God has set forth something for you that in His presence, He says, is of such value that there is not a term that can properly and adequately express the value for you. And that's so. Absolutely so. Um, Dick, there's a bunch of children out there. I wonder if you could maybe, I don't know whether they've missed something or if they need to go somewhere, find out to, if you can. All right, thank you so very, very much, Dick. And <clears throat> now, this is the manner of the conduct. And then he gives you and he gives me some reasons or illustrations from the Scripture. Beginning with verse, uh, uh, verse 5. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also. See that? The holy women. Now he's talking about the holy women also. Who trusted or had hope or had confidence in God. They adorned themselves. This is how they dressed. Isn't it something? Being in subjection unto their own husbands. And once again, let me tell you what the term subjection means. It's hupotasso. And the word hupotasso does not mean servitude or slavery. The word hupotasso means to be properly arranged. Properly arranged. Orderly arranged. Come right on in, folks, if you want to, and find a seat. We're just yakking away here. <laughs> Bless your heart. It's so good to have you. Come on in. There's some chairs back there. Chairs over here. So, <clears throat> it, 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 it isn't that in our... Uh, understanding of this passage of Scripture that the woman has to be a slave. Now we're dealing with 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. But it is that proper arrangement even in a home where there is a split or a divided relationship where there is one member saved, the other member not saved. There's st still to be the carrying on of the function 
and the relationship of man with woman in their order as man and woman. And the man is to carry on his responsibilities, and the woman is to carry on her responsibilities. But in that last reason in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, if the unbelieving is willing to live with the believer, let the believer not leave or put away the unbeliever, because there is the possibility that that believer will win the unbeliever. And here is your illustration from the Scriptures in the Old Testament. Others have done it. Have you ever felt like that they didn't have my situation? <laughs> have you ever felt like that? Man, I have. Many, many times. Well, they just don't know how hard it is. But they didn't have this. Oh, just a minute. I just don't think all of them were lily white in those days. Why, Abraham, that rascal, when he went down to Egypt and they, in that, he, he was saved and she was saved, what did Abraham do when they went down to Egypt because they didn't have much to eat up in, up in uh, Canaan? What did they do? You know what he did? He said, my, I've got a beautiful wife. And if I get down there in Egypt and Pharaoh sees my wife and finds out that she's my wife, my head is going to roll. So, Sarah, uh, now, now don't forget this. You're my sister. Do you understand that? You're my sister. Yes, Abraham, I'm your sister. Well, she was, in one sense, sister in the Lord. Isn't that right? But the liar. And he not only did it once, he did it twice. The Lord had to spank him for that. So, um, uh, Abraham just being a Christian, uh, I think Sarah had her problems with that man. Don't you? I know she did. Down in Egypt. It was a real problem. Now then, here you have God giving instruction with reference to this relationship of the mixed marriage. Now then, in verse 6 and 7, husbands, you have a little instruction here along with, now that we're entering in right now in verse 6 and 7, where the relationship is for the believer, both the believing man and the believing woman. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. <laughs> you want me to translate this a di little different for you? Who have not been made afraid by any terror. Abraham might have given Sarah some problems, but one thing he didn't do. That was, he didn't cower her to the place where she was fearful. Because men, observe what it says in verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. There are three things I want you to see in this verse. First of all, dwell with them according to knowledge. Number two, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Number three, and as being heirs together of the grace of life with the purpose that your prayers be not hindered. Your prayers be not hindered. In this chapter, we brought out that which is exceedingly precious as far as the saved woman is concerned. That which is of the heart, that which is of the life. It also tells us that which is most precious for the husband. A conduct and relationship to the wife so that 
his spiritual life, his prayer life, will not be hindered. I wonder, men, and let me wonder out loud, I wonder if maybe some of the difficulty in our homes, Christian homes, is that the prayer ministry of the head of the home has been hindered because of his relationship to that which God calls exceedingly valuable to him. Husbands dwell live together in accordance with knowledge or this word is gnosis and that word gnosis means a proper rational understanding it is not to take society as it is but to come from God's word realizing the union that you have Dwell with her according to biblical understanding. That's quite a responsibility for you, men, for us all. It behooves us to get in the book, doesn't it? Know what the book says. Secondly, what's it do? <coughs> to give honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Now, the word to give honor is a word which means to dispense. It means to shower. It means to bestow bountifully in a large portion. The word honor, Timae, is that which is a word many, many times used for us to give honor to the Lord. And the same type of relationship the men are to have with their women. Happy is the relationship. That's like this. As under the weaker vessel. Weaker man alive. If there's anything in Scripture I question, it's this. Weak man alive. My wife could outwork me ten ways to one. She can stand there behind that sink and peel those tomatoes and can those tomatoes until two or three o'clock in the morning. About midnight, I say, Night, night. I've had it. I can't take it. It's enough. Something else that I've observed. I've observed how women can seem to take pain far more than men. Men, they pride themselves of being <clears throat> another Charles Atlas of the of humanity, you know, and man, we can take it. Yeah, we can take it all right until someone sticks us with a needle. Eh? You watch the ladies at times. Watch the suffering that they go through and the quietness and the manner in which they Weaker? Well, I know what it means. Men, we're not to try to get them to be Charles Atlases at all. They have their function. They're the vessel of honor. They're the vessel of love. Precious. Great price. And then will you observe the last part of verse 7? And as being heirs together Ladies and men, you better forget this chain of command business 
where the woman is to jump from her spiritual life according to the commands of a man. Your heirs together. Now, when it comes to spiritual relationship, there's absolutely no distinction before God. And remember that. I'm so aggravated at this false concept that's being spread so rampantly today that parents are responsible even when, like me, gray-headed, if my parents were st uh, still alive, I'm still responsible to my parents for my spiritual life. Don't you believe that stuff? We give honor, yes. Our relationship to the Lord spiritually is just like that. You men and you women, your relationship to God is on a personal, individual basis, and you don't do it by proxy. You are held responsible. And right here in this section, the woman is held responsible and the man is held responsible as being a co-heir of the grace of life before God. Don't forget it. You have your proper function as husband and wife in the home, yes. But I'll tell you, you have your individual responsibility before God in light of your spiritual life. And I think that this passage is bring, being... Um, uh, bolstered in the last part of it by this thought. Ladies, I know some of you are having your trials. Men, some of you are having your trials too. But if we just get back to the book, just get back to the instruction of the Word of the Lord and walk and have our being according to thus saith the Lord, you're going to find that this is the best path. And then, men, let's be careful that the prayer ministry, the prayer life, is not hindered, not hindered. In our homes, we're to function properly. And oh, encourage your mates, whatever they may be, to have that personal spiritual relationship with Him. If the unsaved is pleased to dwell with the standards and the conduct and life, spiritual life, of the believer, of the believer, let there not be a separation. Let there not be. Be long suffering, because who knows? when and how the partner might be saved. When there is that demand and requirement for another manner of life, you have to say, I'm sorry. I love you. Let's live together as we should as husband and wife. But before my Lord, I have a responsibility and I wish you knew it. This hasn't answered all your, all your questions or solved all of your problems. But there are principles there that I trust will be of help for you. Above all, do you know my Lord? Do you love Him? If you're not saved this morning, if you haven't trusted in Jesus, your Savior, you're missing life. You are. You're missing that which will give you peace and joy. We trust you've come to love Him, come to know Him, and to walk with Him. Well, the Lord bless you. It's been so good to have all of you. We're dismissed for our morning service. Would you men put out the, out the books? Thank you very much.